our next presenter, uh, like myself, shares a, a real uh, background in rural Wisconsin. Uh, I come from uh, a long history of dairy farming, uh, and our next speaker has some of that history too. And uh, she's going to share with us uh, a perspective about what's going on uh, in our legislature, but more, perhaps more important, what's going on uh, in rural Wisconsin. Kathleen Weinhoff. Thanks for giving up your Saturday, and I'm humbled to be here. Shell shock. That was the way one of the strong Dems described to me the feeling after the election. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do, my friend told me. I suggest that we begin with the numbers and not the media's interpretation of the numbers, but actually the numbers themselves. Give some perspective and for, provide a basis for moving forward. And I think about the media's perspective and then the actual numbers and it takes me back to four years ago when we heard that the GOP, because of the demographics, was about to become extinct. <laughs> Clearly that was wrong. Now the Democrats are being told we're toast. All those rural people were motivated by Trump to vote, and many of them for the very first time, and they all showed up and were toast. Mm, we're not toast. We got to suit up and get back on the field. But it is true that Trump motivated a lot of new voters to go to the polls. I have been doing some homework, talking with election judges, talking with county clerks, looking at voter registration documents, looking at ward results. And I estimate that in my part of the state, um, roughly 10% of the people who went to the polls were new voters, and most of those new voters voted for the very first time. They registered, most of them registered on election day. <laughs> in one city, in Whitehall, in Trempeleau County, I physically counted the new voter registrations in all of Trumpelow County, and I found that there, of all the voters who voted in Whitehall, 24% of them were brand new voters registering for the first time. 24%. And when I looked at the voter registration applications, I could tell because they had to have their birth date about what age they were. And they were in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Sometimes they voted in family blocks. So I remember there were about eight or 10 Gillix fruits from Osseo that all voted. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them lived in the same address. And, and you could tell they were family members, brothers, sisters, wives. But at the same time, those people who usually show up in a presidential year and usually vote Democratic didn't show up in the North and the West. The North and the West, Hillary got slightly more than a usual off year or a non-presidential year. So she didn't motivate other voters to come to the polls. She just got the people who were motivated to come and they were like you and me and they vote in every election and they certainly vote in every off year election. And we were overly optimistic about election day. And the media told us we were a blue state. That Wisconsin hadn't voted for a Republican presidential candidate since Reagan. True, but that's only part of the story. Three of the last presidential races were decided by 22,000 votes or less, so there was Kerry, there was Gore in 2000, won by 5,000 votes. Kerry won by only 10,000 votes. And then, of course, Trump won by 22,000 votes. And Republicans have won the last seven of the last nine races for governor. We are not a blue state. We are a swing state. And we, as Democrats, have to fight for every vote in every election. 
I'm grateful that the media is finally focusing on rural Wisconsin and that folks in my part of the state are being listened to. And yes, the numbers tell us that if Hillary had gotten the normal presidential Democratic vote in the West and the North, we would have won the Democrats and Hillary would have won the state. So there's a lot of work to do in my world in the West and the North. <laughs> but the focus on rural and only rural is incomplete. That's not only what the numbers tell us. The numbers tell us if Hillary had gotten the 2012 Democratic vote out of Milwaukee County, she would have won the state. The numbers tell us if Hillary had gotten a normal Democratic presidential year vote out of the suburbs, she would have won the state. If Hillary had gotten the normal presidential year Democratic vote out of central Wisconsin, she would have won the state. If Hillary had gotten the normal presidential year Democratic vote out of Fox Valley, she would have won the state. Any one of these scenarios, not all of them, would have swung Wisconsin to the win column. <laughs> so the numbers tell us to win, we need to campaign and compete all across the state in our major cities, in Madison, Milwaukee, in the fast growing suburbs all around the, the, the Madison, Milwaukee, but also across from St. Paul, in the Fox Valley, in the middle sized cities, and in the rural areas. <laughs> what this tells us is no matter where you live in Wisconsin, there's work to do. <laughs> but it's good to know we're not toast. <laughs> So to win, we can't take anything for granted. Every voter has to be romanced. Every non-voter has to be convinced that this election matters and that democratic programs and democratic policies will, meet, will make people's lives better and they will make our community stronger. We are one state. Our concerns are the same, whether we're rural, urban or suburban. And thank you, Dr. Kramer, for leading us there, because I'm right with you. <laughs> so, specifics. We love specifics on issues. We all want good schools. We want great schools. We all want safe streets. We all want a clean environment. We want, want efficient transportation, good roads, but also good mass transit. We want fast broadband. We couldn't live without fast broadband, but in my world, a lot of places in Wisconsin, we do. And we want a good paying job. Now, the answers might be different in different parts of the state, but the problems are the same. So we need, we need to talk solutions that make sense to every voter, no matter where they live in the state. And we have to empower local government, cities, counties, towns, villages, across the state to make the best decisions that work for their local communities. Which means Madison and the Republicans need to stop dictating a one-size-fits-all out of the Capitol from elected officials for the whole state. Just as <laughs> So if we want to win statewide elections, we have to advance ideas that resonate across the state, from Green Bay to Greenfield, from Appleton to Ashland, from Milwaukee to Medoro, from Beloit to Balsam Lake, from Madison to Menominee, from Racine to River Falls, from Excelsior to River to Eagle River. Yes, all over the state. One of the finest moments of Obama's presidency, I thought, was his farewell speech in Chicago. And, and I go back to that speech and take inspiration from it. And he gave us a roadmap for thinking about the future. If we don't create opportunity for all people, the disaffection and the division that has stalled our progress 
will only sharpen in the years to come. If every economic issue is framed as a struggle between hardworking white middle class and an undeserving minority, then workers of all shades are going to be left fighting for scraps while the wealthy further withdraw to their private enclaves. Those are Obama's words. And despite what Governor Walker would have us believe, these economic issues are starker in Wisconsin than in many other states, which feeds into what Dr. Kramer's talking about. The claims he makes, the successes he takes credit for, they tell only half the story. So the governor boasts that Wisconsin is gaining back the total jobs lost in the recession. In the recession, but he doesn't tell you that we gained them back a, few, a full year after the national average of gaining them back, and a full two years after Minnesota gained them back. The governor brags, and just recently brags, that we've gotten 40,000 new manufacturing jobs since the recession, since 2009. But he doesn't tell you that we lost 66,000 and we need another 26,000 just to get even. And that he gave $1.3 billion to manufacturing companies and tax breaks to supposedly bring back those jobs. The governor says we are in the top 12 for gross domestic product, so economic you know, wealth, it, it growth and since 2009. Actually, we're not 12, we're 23. <laughs> and we're below Arkansas, Georgia, and Tennessee, and a whole bunch of other states. Yeah. So the governor says wages have improved to the highest ever. <laughs> oh, but he doesn't tell you that in every other state, all 50 states, wages have improved to the highest ever. <laughs> there are 31 states that have higher wages than Wisconsin. And we wonder why people are feeling like they're not getting their own. The governor likes to point out, and his agencies point out, that the unemployment rate is lower than the national average. But that's been true for 28 of the last 30 years, Governor. <laughs> last night I read that the governor tweeted, the unemployment rate dropped to 3.7. More proof Wisconsin is headed in the right direction thanks to bold conservative reforms. In 2000 and 2017, the lowest unemployment rate in Wisconsin. Hmm, what do they have in common? Well, they were at the end of a Democrat's two terms for president. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to brag about that. boasted about our workforce participation rate, that we have a lot of people in the workforce in Wisconsin. Well, that's been true for 30 of the last 30 years. <laughs> I keep expecting the governor one day to, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to hear that the governor took credit for the sun rising. <laughs> so these political numbers are as important to keep in mind as the, or the economic numbers are as important to keep in mind as the political numbers. And, and they help explain the world that Dr. Kramer has been documenting. And the lessons that we take from these political numbers and from our recent experience is that we win when we build bridges with rural areas and our cities. When we focus on what all of us want and want to create, great schools for our children, clean water everywhere, safe streets in the cities and towns, good roads and efficient transportation, affordable health care, great places we can go to play, whether it's an art museum or a state park. We must turn our frustration, our disappointment, our anger into action. <laughs> Democracy demands our involvement. And not just at election time, not just when a really bad bill is headed for a really quick passage, it has to be 365 days a year. And we have to focus on results, 
we have to focus on electoral change. And I'm going to quote President Obama in the speech I really like. I love, I like a lot of this. If something needs fixing, then lace up your shoes and do some organizing. If you're disappointed in your elected officials, grab a clipboard, get some signatures, and run for office yourself. Show up, dive in, and stay at it. Now in the West, Sheila Danielson and many of us in Western Wisconsin got involved because of the exploitive activity of the sand mines. But we quickly learned, unless we translated that unhappiness about the sand mines into election day successes, we were not going to have the county, kind of county board and town board that we needed in order to protect our homes and our families. Our unhappiness had to be translated into helping and motivating other people to join our grassroots groups, to join our party, to join new neighborhood groups that were coming together and new environmental groups that were coming together, to become active in a campaign, to show people if they vote and they vote for our progressive-minded candidates, they can make a difference in their everyday lives. Our goal is a big tent, a coming together of like-minded people, of people willing to say to each other, hey, you're not exactly like me, but <laughs> I'm okay with that. And we can work together to win. We have to reach out to people. And people that are from organized labor and they're waitresses or they're construction workers, or public employees who are still suffering from the effects of Act 10 and the hateful rhetoric that diminished their work for us. These people need to be encouraged. They're our natural allies. We need to reach out to them, to have them talk to their neighbors, to ask the union people to talk with their brothers and sisters in labor. And our focus should be on our own wards, should be on our own towns, our own neighborhoods. What can't be said about listening? Think about how we could do this. Starting with a list of voters that we have, visit our neighborhoods, sit down to people, listen, sit down with people, listen to what they talk, what they talk about. Keep track of what goes in, on in the neighborhood. Who goes to a nursing home? Who turns 18 and needs to be registered to vote? Where to go? How to get the ID that you need? What, what, what ID to take? How to vote absentee? Asking people about what's important to them and listening, taking notes, and going back a second and a third time. What Kathy said was beautiful. It's exactly what all of us need to do. We have to help folks connect the dots between if they vote, how they vote, the problems they face, and what's going on with those people who they voted for. And if there's anything I learned in my time in politics is that the most important decisions are made on election day. <laughs> so we have to be thinking, talking, recruiting, and registering people 365 days a year, regardless of whether, whether there's a hot election next year. It's up to us, it's up to each of us to help get that job done. Nobody's gonna do it for us. If we're gonna turn around our country, if we're gonna build those vibrant communities that we, we dream about, about a state that actually responds to the needs of the people, solving the problems that Karen brought to us. We have to do it. We have to do it. We can stop the war machine. We can have a living wage. Workers can be free to organize. We can extend health care to everyone. Our water and our air can be clean, and we can slow down climate change. We can welcome and assimilate immigrants. Voting can be easy and accurate. <laughs> Elected officials can be responsive. <laughs> Government can be transparent and effective. We can reduce the influence of money in our elections. work for everyone. How? Let's start by winning the next election. That effort starts today. It starts
starts here, it starts now. And it starts with us. Thank you very much.